Welcome to the Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people, but not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry. With me, as always, is... Where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? That's a dumb question, Miss Grimbridge. Eddie, I better read his truth. And happy Halloween! We are talking about Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Released October 22nd, 1982. Wow. Which is my birthday. Not, oh, the, no. not the year. Oh, birth year. Yeah, not the year. <laughs> three, not the year, just the birth date. Three years okay. later, but yeah. What's your What's your birthday movie? Like uh, your I don't... I don't share it because uh, I don't want my identity stolen. Oh, God. <laughs> Edward, nobody wants to steal your identity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All my riches, all my wealth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe someday I'll tell you right. when it's unavoidable. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. You know, I have, I have this and I have the grudge. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, like the Sarah Michelle Gellar. Grudge. Yeah, a little Sarah Michelle Gellar going yeah. on and a little uh, Connell Cochran going on. That's not bad. Little Tom Atkins, <laughs> yeah. Little Tom Atkins action. Atkins action. Uh, Atkin, Amber Atkins. Amber. Amber. <laughs> <laughs> the drop dead gorgeous character. <laughs> Tom Atkins. Are we ever really far from it? Are we no, ever? We're never really far so. from Mount Rose, Minnesota. That's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh. Um, so. Yeah. It's Halloween time. You know, we have a tradition of doing the Halloween movies. Uh, yeah. And we've, we've, you know, messed things up because uh, we started with uh, 2018 and yeah. then did Kills and Ends. Um, yeah. And then we we're sort of like, well, we, we started at the end now because we, we wanted to, like, hit those movies when they were released theatrically. So right. now we're... Um, we're backtracking. We did H2O. We did Resurrection. Uh-huh. And I think that... I don't know what the plan was next, but we got to the end of the month here. And we're like, oh, shit. We didn't really, uh, <laughs> I guess, plan this very well. So we just had um, the one the one episode left. So, well, let's just do Season of the Witch. Because... It's, the, it's, it's the, the only timeline that has one movie. Yeah. So, yeah. It's there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, and we're fans, I think. <laughs> yeah well it's funny that you mentioned it's like the only timeline with one movie because there's there's always a threat and i want to call it a threat because i i feel like it's, they're never going to make do with it but it's a threat because a lot of people don't care for this uh entry right 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 um but i know that um i don't d- so does blumhouse still own the rights to the halloween franchise or is that was that done with with hens Oh, you got me. I don't even know if it has to be renewed or uh, anything like that. I, yeah. As far as the news uh, covering that kind of information, yeah. I have nadel. Because remember, they changed I, their like their opening bumper logo thing, and they included yeah Michael to have Myers. Michael Myers in and it. It's, yeah, yeah, but they waited until Hens to do that. I'm just like, but if that's if you lost the rights after this, you know, you're just got to do it over. But uh, uh, Jason Blum did say at one point, and this was like two years ago. It's like. Well, we might like make a legacy sequel to Season of the Witch or something like that. And there's actually a lot of people who are down for that. Um, From Blumhouse. I <laughs> I know, I know, but like the thing, the thing that works about this or like that idea of just sort of the uh-huh. the anthology is that it would be an anthology. So you don't have to do a continuation of this. Just make up a new Halloween story, which was what the that. original intent was, uh, mm-hmm. that every new Halloween sequel would just be focusing on a different Halloween event uh, that was like completely far removed from whatever the last one is. And mm-hmm. I think that, you know, given like where we are today with how popular like anthology series are, like, I, I mean... American Horror Story was popular. I don't know where it stands right now. The guess is as good as mine but, these days. Yeah. yeah, but there's, like, people do like the idea of that. You know, like, even bringing back the same cast, having them play different characters, mm-hmm. which we do see in this movie. Um, but I think that the concept would have worked successfully had they never made Halloween 2. 
Because that um, set a precedence for Michael Myers to be coming back. I don't time. know. I mean, given the ultra hit status of the original, I mean, it was a sleeper hit, but it, because it spent so much time kind of uh, accumulating everyone's interest and knowledge and attention uh, in the mainstream consciousness, I wonder if it would have just happened earlier, if people had, would have gone to a sequel to Halloween expecting to see Michael Myers, and if they would have been just as disappointed if it happened after one movie as they were when it happened after two. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I think I, that I'm the, not in the, the prediction business. Yeah, because <laughs> this at this point, um, Friday the Thirteenth came and and that yeah. had a sequel before Halloween Two came out, mm -hmm. um, and I'm pretty sure that Friday the Thirteenth Three came out before because mm -hmm. it was the same year, so that would have come out before mm -hmm. Halloween Two. Um, so I think it was just this expectation, like there was this growing interest in Jason, um, yeah. that. You already had Michael come back again. That it was just going to be a thing. Like, okay, we're we're getting more Michael. Uh, by the by the time Freddy Krueger was introduced in '84, um, that's why they, they had to bring him back for for Michael for Halloween Four because at that yeah. point he's contending with these heavyweights who have already kind of like become these larger than life uh, horror characters. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I I think that it would have been successful like had there not been a halloween 2 had it just been from that point mm -hmm. on and you know that, that that's what carpenter and deborah hill wanted to do from the onset i mean they didn't even want to make sequels to halloween yeah but when the opportunities kept presenting themselves they're like okay well we're gonna do this and yeah and i think they were happy to do that. like you know carpenter talks about halloween 3 um a lot more positively than he talks about halloween 2 uh, which he, he referred to as an abomination. Uh, yeah. And he didn't really have uh, very kind words for Rick Rosenthal. Not that they were, like, unkind, but he was just sort of like, nah, he's not that great, in, in mm. like, the John Carpenter kind of way. Um, of <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, it's anyone's guess. Uh, unfortunately, we, or fortunately, we don't live in that uh, universe where the Halloween franchise was all anthology, so... Here we are now, you know? <laughs> I mean, I remember the first time that I saw this. Uh, it was not in the theaters. I wasn't old enough to see it in the theaters uh, when it was released. Um, I was a mere, mere, mere baby. But um, I remember uh, just seeing among the VHS on my, <laughs> on my shelves that my father taped off of, you know, the television, there was one that was called Halloween 3. And I had already seen the first Halloween so I must have been, I don't know, maybe fourth, fifth grade. And I remember uh, taking it off the shelf, asking my dad, is this like, and he said, yeah, but don't get your hopes up. And that's all I got. So I didn't know what I wasn't supposed to get my hopes up about, but I didn't care. I was just kind of like, oh, you, you hate all my horror movies that I like anyway. You don't really care for slasher movies, so I'm probably going to really like this. So I put it in and I started watching it. And I remember the first stings of the synthetic score by John Carpenter with this also kind of, you know, digital synthetic pumpkin. <laughs> and I thought, are we going to space? And thankfully, we still haven't turned that corner in this particular franchise. <laughs> we don't have Michael Myers in space yet. Yeah. Um, but it's just a matter of time. But anyway. Uh, it couldn't be any remember... worse than where we've gone, you know. <laughs> I mean, we, could be, in, we so... could be in a house for an entire movie with... Uh, yeah, right? Like, low-quality <laughs> cameras, yeah. There, that's true, that's mm -hmm. true. We can, you can make your own type of bad movie in, in this franchise. But um, I just remember think, getting kind of excited, but also a little scared, because I thought, like, Michael Myers in space, how is that going to work? It seems so modern to me compared to... It was weird uh, compared to the first movie. And then uh, I watched things unfold, and I remember it might have been the first time I sat in a movie and realized not all movies are good. When you're a really, really young kid, I don't. I didn't really know from bad movies or good movies. I just watched movies. How old were you? I must have been like uh, like fourth or fifth grade. So what is that for me? That's like maybe nine, nine. years old. Yeah, yeah like yeah. about nine years old when I saw it. And uh, up until that point, um, I, I, I also was really low maintenance as far. You could just turn something on and I'd sit there and watch it. Unless I really thought it was going to scare me. Like I didn't watch any of the Xenomorph alien movies because the xenomorph scared me mm. for a long time and 
Um, but I remember, uh, and, and the first Halloween scared me when I saw it. But then when I when I watched this one, I remember the line, the exchange that I just did at the top of this. That was the moment I was just kind of like, what? And I don't think I ever did that in a movie before. <laughs> where I was just kind of like, like I don't know, shaking my head and, and going like, really? This is, this is happening right now it's not motivated by anything it's not being paid off by something that was planted earlier that i could detect in my child brain but and i remember i did not like it uh the first time i saw it and it wasn't until i returned to it many years later maybe when i was a teenager i don't even remember and i just kind of thought oh this movie yeah okay and then i watched it and i was actually kind of like well that was i mean it's dumb but it's fun and I think with each time I've screened it, I've come to kind of like seal my fate as a fan more and more. Because uh, I can, it is a turn your brain off. Like I am going to ask a bunch of questions as we move through this, but because um, <laughs> I want to know what you think. But yeah. um, in addition to that, like uh, what do you, what was your first experience? Can you remember it with this movie? So, you know, I've, I've, explained this before that uh with this franchise i didn't see it in order when it uh you know when i first started watching it and this would have been the point like it, halloween wasn't on my radar until h2o came out mm -hmm. or, or right before that because i think the first my first exposure to halloween was in scream mm -hmm. and them watching it on <laughs> on, on the tv there um mm behind Eugene. Yeah, so, and that was about the same time that, you know, Halloween H2O had already been in production and it was coming out the the following summer. Mm -hmm. So, I saw the first movie. I saw the, actually the first, the first movie I saw was the sixth one. Uh, right. Curse, yeah. <laughs> and, because in the video store, it, like, it didn't have the number on it. It was just, like, Halloween, yada, yada, yada. And it wasn't actually the video store. It was, like, a Mon Pa uh, convenience store where they had video rentals. And I remember asking, like, is this is this Halloween? Is this, like, the, the original Halloween? And they're just, like, looks like it. <laughs> so, and I was, was, like, what, 12 at the time. So I was just, like, sure. okay. So I rented it, and I'm completely confused, like, Curse of Michael Myers is the worst movie to to start off on, <laughs> thinking that this is like the like it's just the most convoluted in terms right. of like story. So that was my first exposure, and I was like pretty pissed off because I was, I mean it was scary because Michael's mm -hmm. like pretty uh, violent in that one, but I was like okay, I, I definitely know this is not the movie because I remember seeing it in Scream, yada yeah. yada yada. So I eventually found the the original watched that mm -hmm. then there was halloween 4 and those were the only ones i could really find for a while wow. and i think h2o came out i saw that in the theater and of course i was just like confused because it's just like i don't remember seeing him burn i thought for some reason that <laughs> halloween 6 was halloween 2 i don't like this is oh before the internet this is before like all that stuff so i was just an idiot apparently you needed um, a horror mentor is yes what you needed <laughs> well you know what i i had to self-teach myself <laughs> self-teach self myself great english <laughs> um so i remember tracking down halloween 2 next and seeing mm -hmm. that and, and feeling like oh my gosh this is like the watching the first one all over again with like a like an extended version to it and then Five and three were the only, like, the two that I hadn't seen. And mm -hmm. I was asking kids at school who had seen them, and um, this one girl was telling me, like, you know, you don't want to see Halloween 3. It's terrible. It has nothing to do with Michael Myers. Um, just skip it. And I remember seeing that on the shelf and just, like, okay, I guess I won't see this. I'll just look for mm -hmm. five. And I eventually found five and watched it. But then once that was done and I had, you know, rented the original so many times and Halloween four so many times, I just got to a point where like, okay, I need new content. So I finally went and watched Halloween three and yeah, I didn't like it cause it wasn't Michael Myers. Like that was the, the takeaway yeah. from it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know at what point things switched for me. 
um, like how much later in in my years before I kind of realized that I did really like this movie. But now every time I watch it, like I just you know get such a kick out of it. Um, mm-hmm. I think that it's you know I I I would need to watch them all again because you know my opinions constantly change of like rankings and stuff. But I think like mm-hmm. the the first three are the best. Because it's yes. all John Carpenter. Even if John Carpenter isn't officially directing it, you know that John Carpenter directed it. And, like, it's like, here you go, Rick Rosenthal. Like, take credit. Tommy Lee Wallace, like, take credit. <laughs> you don't think so? Uh, no, not really. But, <laughs> but, I mean, I do believe that, like, his input was, like, uh, probably invaluable to, to people. But also, I mean, just given, like, the way he... he barely interacted with Rob Zombie, you know, based, you know, when he was passing off, passing the torch, as it were, you know, to him. All he said was, make it your own. I, I, I believe that he'd probably have a little bit more faith in the people who are taking it up. And also, it means, like, is he's still a producer, he's still getting a paycheck, and it means he doesn't have to do nearly as much work as he did on the first yeah. one, nearly as much scrambling. But I'm sure he, I mean, he's... He's scoring it, and I'm sure he must have a hand in the editing. Then, yeah. See, well. I don't, I don't agree with that because, like, he said in interviews that there's like, there was sort of like a, a divide between him as a creative and him as a producer. And mm. in the earlier stages of his career, which would have been, you know, the '70s, the early '80s, uh, he was very much so. It was like the creator was the the side of him that was coming out more, and he, you know, he wanted these mm. movies to be good. He he, he sure. th- there were certain things about it like he obviously went into Halloween 2 and reshot so much stuff because it was just like no this isn't good this isn't good um, right. so you know I, I know for a fact that he did write this the script for Halloween 3 like even though Tommy Lee Wallace is credited the guy who mm-hmm. initially wrote like the first draft or whatever he didn't want to have anything to do with it so John Carpenter took over and like really cleaned up most of it uh, and at the end of the day he didn't want the credit either so he uh, like Tommy Lee Wallace was the only person left so he's just like yeah I may as well take it even though I no no no, this is this is this is documented I believe I could I I, you know I there's always a chance I'm wrong but I remember reading this (laughs) and uh, Tommy Lee Wallace was like the only one left who like had some input so even though he did the least for the script he Mm -hmm. has the sole script writing credit when it comes mm. to this movie. So that's why I think that there's a lot more involvement. Like you see the the vision of the first three films. Like it feels so John Carpenter that it's hard to, to imagine that, you know, he didn't have a, a larger hand in, in the production of these. But, you know, as, as the years went on, he became more cynical. You know, he's the, the John Carpenter we all know and love, just like the crotchety grandfather. And he talks more about how like he's, more of a producer now you know he doesn't you know Mm -hmm. care much about the creative side it's more about getting paid for it and and he's cynical like that but he's fine with it if he's making money well when you've been burned as many times as he has too like i mean it's been it's been it's been rough times sometimes uh being john carpenter in hollywood uh or just Mm -hmm. in the film industry but um in terms of like the general aesthetic, like we've brought up like the two thirty five one aspect ratio before in our discussions about like at least the first three movies and and you've made no secret about the fact that like that's you know your that's your timeline. But yeah. um it's uh, not even a real timeline. It's just like a production. Not even a real timeline, just yeah. just the original run. Just the yeah. first no, three. My, you know, my timeline before... is is like one, two, four like the the, the Loomis yeah, 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 timeline yeah, yeah. as the, I call it. Just the, like one, the Jamie two, four, and five, the Jamie six. Lloyd. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, whatever. But um, but that's your Michael Myers timeline, which you say you favor that timeline, or not even timeline, but that sequence yeah. of Halloween movies over the original three. If you had to choose one well, over the, the yeah, other, yeah, that's a, your... like, yeah. If we're if we're if we're picking a sequence of movies, then yeah, one, two, three. If we're picking a timeline, one, two, four, okay. five, gotcha. six. Gotcha. Yeah. Semantics are everything. I know. But um, said the Virgo, but. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, now it, it's funny that I, uh, I I had, I remember just being thrown the first time I heard the score and now every time I put it on, it's just kind of, it's odd. It's so comforting to me and it almost feels um, in a weird way, uh, something about, I, I don't understand what it is, but there's something about what happens to me when I listen to it that I find soothing and like, you know, like a comfort 
score um, when it's made to unsettle you and to kind yeah. of, you know, like, <laughs> like knock you off balance. But I mean, in that vein, like it, probably even more so than the, the opening for Halloween, because the opening for Halloween doesn't give me comfort. I, I, I can I can have faith that what I'm about to sit through, you know, like particularly with the original movie or even the second, uh, even the first sequel. Um, I'm just kind of like, ah, you know, like this is going to be good. But I am starting, I do feel myself starting to tense up. This one, I I don't know, maybe it's because I do get to shut my brain off a bit more and just <laughs> and just kind of sit there and just kind of laugh a little yeah. bit more. Uh, maybe I'm just a little, uh, uh, there's a bit more of a surrender involved. Like, I mean, a complete surrender of the senses where I'm just going to like, do to me what you will. And I can go, ha, 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 if I want to. <laughs> yeah. But I can also appreciate like the genuine artistry of things like the score and like the cinematography, which I think is actually pretty strong in this movie. Yeah, like the the regular Halloween score, like there's a, the, the tempo to it, um, yes. or just like the arrangement, like it is very unsettling. Like that, mm-hmm. do, 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 like that. Whereas like this is just like it just feels like kind of like hums and and uh, stings and it's sort of it is soothing because yeah. it's almost like you know like you put on a noisemaker or something that you're like you, you know using to right. fall asleep to uh, a like, humidifier you know, even yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just like you know it's like the ASMR of things of just like uh-huh, you know it, it it just relaxes it just relaxes you it's like a, it's it's I wouldn't say that it's not unsettling but um, it's a different kind of unsettling that i feel you know comfortable with of course like the the regular halloween theme is is a you know a wonderful little ditty um <laughs> you could call it that an, an earworm but uh no I, yeah. I at times i do prefer the score to halloween 3 uh because mm. it's like you could like it doesn't it's not as repetitious we'll say like the with john carpenter's original halloween score it's pretty much the same thing through most of it like there's some nuances here and there with like like Laurie's theme and right. uh like when dr loomis is you know regaling uh sheriff bracket of like the story of like yes. michael as a, as a child like those like the uh the composition that he does there whereas like everything right. in this score for halloween 3 it just feels like it's completely like it, everything sounds like something new other than the happy happy halloween which is oh, which God. is is uh london bridge is falling down of course <laughs> yeah because it's because it's, it's it's uh uh free um and i remember how do you, how do you feeling say it? Tortured. like yeah tortured it's a by public, the public earworm. domain yeah right 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 public domain yeah. uh but but still an earworm and i mean the thing is like i could never remember having london bridges falling down getting stuck in my head but there was something about the when every time again first screening i remember every time it came on i was like oh my god again like for the first time i found myself losing my patience <laughs> with a movie mm-hmm. uh and then i started to find out there was a universality to that like when i would discuss this movie the usually one of the first things people would discuss is the and they'd start saying and just like yeah and it was like this misery that we that i shared <laughs> with other horror fans in my teens and in my 20s and then I don't, I don't, again, it's not like a, then one day I changed my mind. It was just something I kept coming back to because that's what we do as horror fans. We keep coming back to even the installments in the franchises we love that we don't really, you know, care for as much as some others. Mm -hmm. And it just grew kind of like, kind of like a lot of the Friday the 13th sequels for me as well. There were, I thought I really disliked that franchise the first time around but I couldn't stop watching it. <laughs> just trying to figure out, like, is there something I'm not getting? And then I started getting stuff. And then it yeah. just became kind of like, you know, a person who, maybe like a neighbor who, they live next door, so they're close. So <laughs> yeah. may as well be kind and invite them over for tea or something, you know? Yeah. And then the more you get to know about them, the more you're like, okay, you're not so bad. I thought I our, our first meeting wasn't the best, but I, I, I can stand you. And then you start mm. going like, oh, I miss that person. <laughs> yeah. why, why aren't there more people in the world like this person who used to annoy me and who now I'm just kind of like you're a part of you know you're woven into the tapestry of well, my life it feels like the the biggest complaint because there's still people who absolutely detest this movie and would rank it below yeah. like a resurrection <laughs> for instance um, and obviously I don't agree with that because I you know 
you know, I think it's it's top tier, but uh, <laughs> it, you can't look at a movie like this and say that this is a bad movie. It just doesn't have Michael Myers in it. And I think that <laughs> that's typically the excuse that people will come up with as to like why they dislike this movie is because it's not Michael Myers, which is the same mm -hmm. reason why people don't like uh, Friday the 13th uh, 5, because it's not mm -hmm. Jason. Um, so... You know, I find with, with horror audiences especially, there's, like, a certain thing that they'll glom onto. It's just, like, why is this something that uh, people don't like? And it'll just be, like, a very basic reason that's not really reflective of the movie itself. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, like, Terrifier 3 just came out. And I, I've only seen the second movie. Um, but people are, you know, that are against it or just, like, hate these movies are just, like... Oh, it's just way too gory. I don't, I don't like the gore. It's terrible. And it's like, we've lived through the Saw franchise. We had Hostel. Like, this is not anything new. Like, I, I get that, like, from what I understand, it's pretty intense. But uh -huh. I just can't see people um, disliking something because it's um, too gory. I think that audiences will kind of glom onto like a, a, a certain aspect that a lot of other people will complain about and just say that oh, yeah. they, like it's an easy way to justify why you don't like mm -hmm. it but if you watch the movie like you know i might say well like this is way too long for one uh there's no story <laughs> um and that would be that would be the issue with me because i'd be like it's yeah. you know there's just a lot of filler and folder all in this uh i wouldn't really mind the gore like i don't go to movies horror movies specifically to see gore if it's mm -hmm. there, that's fine. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I just have noticed this pattern with a lot of people will just kind of, you know, almost it's almost like you're just going with the herd and like, oh, I heard this, so that's why I don't. Like yeah, it. where um, the sound bite gets repeated over and over again until it becomes kind of synonymous with the the piece, or at least with discussions uh, in social circles about the piece. And that yeah, that can yeah. be unnerving. But that's also it's interesting because the more you, you hear a point of contention like that uh, as, you know, as authentic or inauthentic as it may be to that person's actual opinion, it, 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 you can still find a way into a discussion sometimes. If you have yeah. the time and the inclination, like you can, you, 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 you know, can sit here and talk about, well, actually, that's not what bothered me. What bothered me was, you pointed out, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, they're starting to express their own ideas and they're starting to yeah. dig a little deeper. And, or they may not even remember. That's another thing. So often in conversations with people like they'll criticize the shit out of something or like oh but i haven't seen it in 20 years it's or like, they oh. have or they haven't seen it at all or they haven't seen it at all yeah but that's, <laughs> or like i'm <laughs> but it goes it goes both ways because people will praise a movie that they haven't seen in so long because they liked it when they saw it 20 years ago but if you watch it today it's like that's, sure that's maybe not like you wouldn't feel the same way about it because uh, i find myself you know, thinking that way, like doing this podcast with you, we have covered a lot of movies that I like thought I really loved, and then you watch it again, and we're like, no, <laughs> what? What the fuck was that? Um, we we haven't even done an intro yet, or a premise, right. I should say. Um, mm -hmm. So, real quick uh, for housekeeping, uh, I just wanted to say that if you are brand new to the Cherry Picker, uh, welcome, uh, congratulations on finding us, and uh, <laughs> we we do this uh, three times a month. We have a bonus episode uh, as well, which is the fourth episode of the month, which is called the Cherry Picker After Dark, which is available if you head over to my Patreon, www.patreon.com slash Zach Cherry, Z-A-C-K-C-H-E-R-R-Y, and that is $5 a month with the Freddy Krueger tier. You go, will get access to that episode as well as all of the previous episodes, which there's like 30 plus of them at this point. And uh, as a Patreon exclusive, um, it's only available to watch there. This month, uh, if you love the Halloween franchise, we did a kind of a, I, I don't know how you would want to call it, like an investigative, uh, we, we wanted to look at the <laughs> analytics or the data yeah. of uh, the, the, the critical consensus among the franchise. So we looked at uh, Rotten Tomatoes, we looked at IMDb, Letterboxd, and just compared mm -hmm. the scoring. Because that's, yeah. you know, speaking about like uh, audience opinions and critics' opinions, like it's with yeah. a franchise like this, it's so fascinating to see the where things line up and where things are inconsistent. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a 
full three hours of us going through each movie uh, <laughs> and putting them under a microscope. If you want to check that out, uh, <laughs> you might have a really good time with that. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to thank... Uh, some Patreon supporters of mine. So for Ooh. top tiers, Michael Myers uh, tier, we've got Kyle Beard, Maxime Rivest, Ali Hamouche, Shane Allingham, Tim McKay, Stephanie Starbright, Horror Slut 95, Bruce the Genetic Jackhammer Rando, Josh Carr, uh, Gemma Louise, Michael Boswell, Brandy Beebe, and then Ghostface, we got Eric Champney, we got Sam Levy, welcome back to Ghostface. Cheers, Sam Levy. We got Daniel Saturn, Baby Ghoul, Garrison Nichols, and Craig Lynn. Thank you very much to all of the Patreon supporters. Really appreciate you guys. You are keeping the engine running. Uh, also, a, a, a huge thank you to our editor, Jay Voorhees Galatello. Jason Whoa. Voorhees Galatello. Yes. Uh, you're also keeping the engine running. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, hit us up with a premise. Uh, how should I read it? How do you, Are you going to read it in Irish? <laughs> I, 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 ooh, I don't know. Okay, I can try. I ooh, Irish. When I, see, the problem is whenever Irish. I think about doing an Irish accent, I always think about David Boreanaz's <laughs> Irish accent in the flashbacks of as Angel. Angel. Yeah. And he's one of the most heavily criticized. <laughs> I mean, okay, I've offended the French. I can offend the Irish. No, no offense intended. Yeah. But all right. <laughs> An apparent murder-suicide, all in the vicinity of a hospital emergency room, leads Ellie Grimbridge, the murder victim's daughter, to investigate her father's untimely demise. But now... With the help of the on-call doctor, Dr. Dan Chalice, and a six-pack, will this unwitting trio prove brave and tenacious enough to uncover the truth behind the death of Ellie's father before the moon sets on this Halloween 3 season of the witch? <laughs> very nice. La very lucky charms. Yeah, very, very lucky, lucky charms. Apologies <laughs> or, all or very leprechaun. <laughs> very leprechaun. Nice. <laughs> I think I got a little Scottish in there, too. <laughs> you yeah. did good. Better yeah. than I could ever do. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank where, you. where is this available to, to watch, by the way? Well, if you're looking for it... now, oh, I'm a different kind of Irish. If you're looking for it on subscription-based platforms, you can find it on Shutter AMC+. Plus. And Peacock, or it's available for individual rental on platforms like Apple TV, Prime, and YouTube. Also, there's a Blu-ray collector's edition that I have somewhere in here. Oh, I got uh, that covered. You, you just yeah, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I got from I... Scream Factory in 2012, and then there's yeah. The okay, Edward, this is my time to shine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the collector. You've got your measly shelf of like. 10 oh, for the love of there. God. <laughs> You wouldn't tell me the rules before the game started. Though. I have no. I have four. I have five versions of this this movie actually. But oh I have the. Uh, uh, if you're looking at the screen, I got the the box set behind me from Scream Factory, like the big one with all ten movies in it before the mm -hmm. David Gordon Green bullshit. Um, I also have that one that you, you know, showed, yeah. that, which is the original Scream Factory release. Uh, Twenty twelve. Like interesting cover art. I don't know. Okay, it's going to be... Boring. There you there we go. go. Yeah, with the, it came this, into focus for those yeah. who are listening. Yeah, thank you. Focus. <laughs> I've got the steel book of it Ooh. as well. Uh, and actually, there's like a, an Easter egg. There's like the Michael Myers mask, uh, right? Oh. Right, do you see it? <laughs> yes, here, I here, see yeah, it. Yeah. On, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. It's cute. And uh, yes, Michael is in the movie. Um, and then I've got the oh, most yeah. uh, recent uh, 4K uh, edition mm -hmm. that they, they put out. 2021 um, yeah bit. so all yeah. that all that jazz There's many ways to uh, to own this movie and i have a dvd somewhere it's you know <sighs> stuffed away <laughs> but uh yeah i i i i uh, like to do my part in collecting physical media oh great <clears throat> yeah. so you can find it any of those particular places folks yeah i need to stop <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the uh, the the six pack of beer 
Yeah. Uh, when he's on the phone with his ex-wife, played by um, Nancy Loomis, yes. uh, reprising. Well, I guess she's not reprising her role. She's playing a completely new role. But uh, she, she may as well a, be the same. Re, it, she's it's a like, reanimated corpse. It's Annie. <laughs> it, like you know, just give her like ten more years and and two kids and just <laughs> a, yeah, Annie's a divorce. twin. Yeah. Annie had an estranged twin sister she didn't know about. She's who... just like this. This. Yammering fishwife on the phone. She's just like, bah, bah, bah. like you can hear her. It's like the teacher in Charlie Brown. <laughs> right. <or like>, You're <laughs> just like, where the hell have you been? Yeah, like yeah. that's the entire essence of the character. Yeah, and it's mostly Charles's through the point of view. Yeah, mostly through the phone. But I love that he. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I got this real important conference where he just like hangs up the payphone, grabs this six pack, and runs off with this like twenty year old girl. And... He does not know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's because. Um, We've we've uncovered a pattern. <laughs> you and I were were just like dysfunctional family breakfasts uh, in, yes. in the movie. So I'm just like, what would you, you know? Because there's always something that you know, like Halloween four with the do you want an oinker for a daughter? And then of course all the right. Rob Zombie bagel and the you know <laughs> skull yeah. fucking and the H two O breakfast. Like there's just every Halloween movie it seems like has a you know peanut butter on my penis. So I'm like, what's the mm-hmm. Halloween 3 version? And I'm like, I guess that it's he's, like, abandoning his family with a six-pack. Like, that's his breakfast. <laughs> there are no Strodes in Season of the Witch, so there, there is no breakfast the to cha- be had. The chalices. You don't deserve part, yeah. breakfast with your father. Mm-hmm. He's going to go get something else on his penis. But um, I, <laughs> I did um, think, though... Uh, I remember. I think we pointed this out maybe on the old pod, like that the yeah. the introduction, of, the reintroduction of like a pumpkin in the opening credits and everything like that. Something else occurred to me though while I was watching it this time, because I remembered how the you know the original pumpkin uh, in the 1978 Halloween, you know, as we get closer and closer, the eye and the nose are supposed to combine to look like you know like the shape holding a knife. And that was, you know, like the subliminal thing that your eye was supposed to kind of like relax and see pop out as we got closer mm-hmm. and closer. Mm-hmm. And I just started to think, like, is there a, a, a similarity between that and what we get here? And the only thing I could think was there's no like kind of like because it's a completely symmetrical jack-o'-lantern that we're mm-hmm. zeroing in on. So there's no like imperfections and there's nothing to really kind of like pop out and magic eye poster about. But because it's immediately followed after the director's credit by the flashing that happens that is supposed to kill you. I'm like, oh, okay, Michael Myers was the instrument for your demise in the first movie, and in this one, it literally is the flashing pumpkin. They're still, they are showing you what you're supposed to be afraid of, because that's really the only thing you're supposed to be afraid of in this. I mean, I guess you could be afraid of the bots if you want, but like maybe it's automation. So immediately I was just kind of like, okay, thematically, we're introducing symbols and you know like things to kind of drop into your psyche that you can carry through the movie with yeah. you if you so choose and i appreciated well, that well this, i guess this that particular it's run. yeah it's sort of the the discovery that they are bots uh yeah. isn't made until later in the movie so i guess that's sort of like uh it's it's a mystery to, to begin with so that is sort of some sort of foreshadowing because obviously he's got um his gal Friday uh, working in the lab, sifting through this like, well, there's there's gonna be body parts in here, and all it is is just like little screws and stuff. So it's not until you know when he's in the factory and uh, like fighting the one guy that he kind of punches into him, and then we get that like weird orange juice stuff coming yeah. out of them. It, it, like that reminds me of like you know those uh, like at the grocery store like the frozen cans yes that you just like mm-hmm, put mm-hmm. the thing in and add water the concentrate yeah, yeah that's what yeah. i used to drink as a kid and yeah. it, it looks like it's just defrosted like um because you usually usually the way we used to do it is just let it sit on the on the sink <laughs> while the condensation drips out just so it you know it can mix a little bit more easily so you don't have like orange chunks like little yeah. popsicle bits in your orange juice yeah. but yeah it looks like that but i mean another thing th- that stood out to me like i saw almost immediately when um uh mr grimbridge harry grimbridge uh, who we do not know his name yet, but just this mysterious man outrunning something terrifying. Um, we see these men in suits come up, and the man straddles him, and he manages to pull whatever is kind of like, you know, anchoring this car yeah. <laughs> so it can roll towards him. And the man 
literally turns and uh, there's enough time to react but it just it was one it was the first example of these bots having absolutely no self-preservation or instincts for survival or anything like that and it happened and i feel like the next example happened later when um he commits the the murder suicide if you can call it that but yeah. the self basically hits the self-destruct button uh after uh pulling okay i have a question <laughs> there's that. so much stuff that it's fun to yeah. just kind of wonder about because as harry grimbridge is like you know been brought into the er and he's laying there and the man comes in and covers his mouth and basically pinches the space in between his eyes. It looks like the bridge of his nose, but it's a little bit lower than that. Yeah. And he just kind of pulls. And it looks gruesome. Yeah. And you have no problem, you know, maybe the first time you're watching, just kind of going, ew, oh, he's dead. Okay. I'm watching it this time and I'm going like, would that, what, what did he even do? <laughs> and then I saw later... Um, Teddy, I think, is the one who referred to it as pulling someone's skull apart. Yeah. And I was like, huh, is that what it was supposed to be? Because really it looked like he just kind of dislodged the cartilage and broke the guy's nose. Yeah. But if you pulled, even if you did break bone in the skull between someone's eyes and pulled out, yeah. would that be enough to kill someone? Well, I think <laughs> it, like it's somehow like there was some sort of brain connection there because he must have like dug okay. in to yeah, maybe. like you know wherever like the frontal lobe is but like it looked like he was like because he sort of like did that scissor thing with his fingers right that he was like right. sticking the, his fingers into the guy's eye sockets and then just okay. like once he was inside he sort of like grabbed and like pulled it out it's okay. a really great effect too like the, the again the yeah. practical effects here are, are amazing but also with that particular thing because i noticed that they do a lot of like the off-screen stuff is yeah. all shown through like the body like quavering like or just like you, you see like the feet uh, shaking and then like the the hands and we do that again later with marge um and then even like with with teddy um mm -hmm. so there's just like it's really effective with how they're they're show what they're not showing essentially yeah like they, they show enough and then what's not seen you know almost makes it scarier but it also called to mind, I remember when we discussed uh, the first Alien, Ridley Scott's Alien. Yeah. And, uh, and when we get, uh, you know, our, our droid uh, basically like exposed and everything like that. And uh, one of the things that struck me was how inorganic yet organic it looked. It looked like a bunch of blown up latex gloves and a lot of bulbs and a lot of cords and a lot of that. Yeah, and, like white and in anal this one, beads. Yeah, I, right. mean, I mean rosary beads. <laughs> 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 oh my god Ro rosary and anal beads all all coexisting in like anal a beads? In, yeah. yes you did in a milk bath but um <laughs> over anal we'll, yeah. yeah oh my god <laughs> and, and ladies and gentlemen please welcome to the stage milky anal beads but um <laughs> anyway um in this case i was like oh, okay they went the more kind of like i i feel a little bit more pedestrian route of like the wires like it really looked like they just bought a bunch of wires from radio shack and just kind of bunched them together yeah. and then we've got of course like the but the gross factor comes from the frozen orange juice of it all so oh, yeah. I, I don't know it was it, it's memorable it's 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 yeah. inventive on a budget i think <laughs> is what i'd call it <laughs> i wonder what because the budget for the movie was i'm gonna look that that up. that i didn't uh check out feel free to look at that and look at the locations for it too i think it looked like it was shot almost exclusively in california it's and california I be surprised. yeah yeah, yeah. I think like, oh, even some the... of the, I, I could be mistaken, but the hospital stuff might have been the same location as Halloween 2. I feel like I heard somebody mention that once, and maybe I really just remember forgetting it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> it, so, it sounds like it could be right. I don't know. Or maybe the other side of the hospital, because that that parking lot looks different. But I mean, mm. who knows? But um, no, just in terms of like the, the, the shooting location too, like it occurred to me when they when they cut away like the damage has kind of been done and the stage is set for halloween night and we start to you know hear the halloween eh, da, 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 halloween and all the trick-or-treaters moving into place and you just get all these cities you know these like captions of which city all over the country these trick-or-treaters happen to be in a bunch of outfits that do not make sense like 
<laughs> there was one girl who was dressed up. I can't remember if it was a pirate or Cleopatra or whatever it was. And she picked up like um, the uh, the skull mask, something that absolutely did not go with whatever she was wearing. So it couldn't have been a pirate. It was probably like Cleopatra or something. But she just like picked up this this skull mask and was like, wow. And I was like, that. Wh why, do you, why are you even interested in that? <laughs> like if I were a kid, I'd want some, I'd think of something that like, kind of went with, what I was wearing. There was also one ballerina. I think she was on a skateboard and she had the jack-o'-lantern mask on. And I just thought, oh, well, that's festive. But um, at a certain point, there was uh, this, um, in, in this montage, we went from Los Angeles, which absolutely looked like a shot from E.T. It made me think about like mm -hmm. Elliot and his siblings, like when yeah. they take E.T. <clears throat> trick-or-treating and everything like that as the ghost. But then they get a shot of Seattle and it looks exactly like L.A., even more so to me. It looks Phoenix. like... And then, yeah, and yeah. then in Phoenix after that, too. Well, just like sort and of that, was... that red sky. Uh... Yeah. Which, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, okay. I want to I want to talk about the 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 film's usage of uh, I guess like subtitles of just like <laughs> locations and dates and times and stuff cuz this is right. it's always kind of been annoying to me, uh, but it especially was last night when I was watching it because it's like we don't need to see like to know like every day cuz most of those days don't even matter. It's just like this is like, I think it starts on the 23rd, and then it's just, like, several days later, the twenty, the 24th, and he's, like, in the bar drinking, and then that's the only thing that happens that day. And then there's, like, a, the next day something happens, and each time they're mm. just showing that. And it just feels like you probably could have just had this all happen on the same day. Not the whole movie, but just, like, these certain things yeah. of just, you know, like, she comes in, talks to him, they go to the store, all that, and they're oh like, okay, God. we're going to we're gonna go. Uh, to, to Santa Mira, but they kept yeah. doing it and it was so distracting every time it would say this and it'd be like the day before Halloween. But then when they do that montage of like all the kids and it's like, yeah. like B Baton Rouge and yeah, right. Los Angeles <laughs> and Phoenix and just like, who cares? We get it. It's like, it's all over the place. Um, right. That, that <laughs> they probably could have streamlined some of this a little bit better and not, not, uh, put attention on uh, like it almost it's like it almost like is treating the audience like they're stupid it's just like we know that this is like a, an international uh, yeah. scheme that he's that he has going on we don't need to literally tell the audience this is in this area and this is and it's mm -hmm. so obviously like you're saying it's not those places so why mm -hmm. even take the risk <laughs> of like making it like not even not even making it look like it's this place. It's just like, let's shoot over there, and that's going to be uh, Florida. You know? <laughs> Turn the camera around. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> this is going to be Cuba. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I think it's 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 the, the, the film, and you already kind of you know touched on this, but I think it's just the film's attempt to try and really escalate the size yeah. of like what's going on. I remember even as a kid, like watching that, that sequence and going kind of like, I don't buy it. Like, <laughs> I know what you're trying to do. And to, like, Oh my God, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. It's, uh, <laughs> and I, I was just kind of like, I don't, I'm still unclear. And as a kid in particular, I was still unclear as to the exact threat. I feel like I have a better handle on it now, but, um, well, let's uh, talk about yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. So Connell Cochran, <laughs> Uh, has his, and we, we did point this out in, yeah. in a previous conversation before, I remember pointing out how James Bondian the course of this film is, and mm -hmm. Connell Cochran is a Bond villain. Oh I my wish. god, and better than like half of them. I know, you know. I agree, 100%. Mm -hmm. He would have been perfect. I mean, even just the way he delivered like, it's all about the children. <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. oh, it was, it's chilling, it was gorgeous. And, but he, um, he, he's he's this notorious trickster, like corporate trickster, like who like, you know, funds like Pee Wee's Playhouse. And, you know, I mean, I just think about like Pee Wee's Big Adventure going into like that joke shop and finding all of those things like, you know, those th those glasses that make you oh, ooh, like and, uh, and like little, I don't know, little games, little gadgets and things. But then the, we talk about like the hallmarks of what he's invented. He was responsible for sticky toilet paper, which I guess I understand the prank there. Like you try to rub your butt and it sticks. And ooh, isn't that funny? Uh, <laughs> what is the dead dwarf gag? <laughs> That's one of the things that Buddy Kupfer 
says. He's going down the line. He's like, he did the skinny, sticky toilet paper. He did the dead dwarf gag. And I'm like, all I could think was like you, like maybe those things, sometimes around, the, around any holiday, like people will put like a witch's leg that like sticks out of their trunk and they shut the trunk and yeah. it looks like they're dry. Or an elf around Christmas. You know, I have no idea. Like in that, with that character, <laughs> buddy, Cuffer, I feel like everyone around him is just sort of like placating him because like Chalice yeah. is like, "Oh, get out! You don't say like, right? He does not give a shit." The wife too, when she's oh. like, she's like, she's like, "What does that mean?" She's like, "I have no idea." <laughs> <laughs> Betty Cuffer actually, let's uh, just, just a little detour. Actually, yeah. kind of like wins my heart in this because. I saw, I noticed uh, around the same time, I think it was after, like, uh, they had gotten to the, the point where I think um, Ellie and Dr. Dan are about to break away from the group as yeah. they're doing their tour of uh, the, the Silver Shamrock Novelties uh, yeah. factory. And, and it looks like Betty Kupfer is kind of talking Marge's ear off and everything like that. And Marge is just kind of staring blankly and smiling. And then they excuse themselves and they walk off. And the way Betty kind of looks dejected by this, you know, like social abandonment, she's like, oh, well, oh, hey. And she kind of, like, almost just like a tiny wave. You just see her in the distance looking after them as they move into the foreground. And yeah. I just thought, this is a lonely woman. Like, she doesn't have a happy marriage with her husband. She no. probably spends most of her time shrugging and laughing nervously. And so that, of course, you know, that's going to yeah. get win my sympathy. But, um, because he also brought up the soft chainsaw. And I was like, is that a gag that whip out a chainsaw? Like you scare someone, you're going to saw them in half. And then, ooh, it's... It's soft. It's plushy. <laughs> <laughs> it's soft. Look, don't be scared of the chainsaw. It's soft. <laughs> but anyway, so Colonel Cochran. Well, you're wanting to know um, about the, uh, like the Stonehenge. And yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Because they, okay, so. they, well, they established that earlier on because the, the gas station attendant is watching the news and they're, right. they're like, we had, it, I don't know where it went. Like, what, how did it disappear? <laughs> Was it <laughs> all of it? Did they take all of it and combine it into whole, that one rock? Well, because they took one because there's several of them. There's yeah, like a whole right. circle of them. And they yeah. took one and brought it to the factory. So the there's like shavings of it that are inside the... yes. The uh, the what would you call that? The like the silver tags. shamrock tag, little yeah. silver shamrock kind of plastic tags, yeah. like that, like On let you back. know it's, it's official like the silver beanie shamrock. baby, like the tie yes. thing that like you you never you don't cut that off, otherwise the the whole thing loses all of its value. For, right, because it's no baby. longer it's no <laughs> yeah. longer valid. It invalidates yeah. the entire. Yeah. But, and then the, <laughs> yeah, the uh, the broadcast, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, like that'll yes. trigger it somehow, or I guess it could even be triggered if you tamper with it because like Marge does the thing and it like, you know, zaps her face, uh, which yeah. is probably the the coolest effect in, in the movie, like not the actual like laser, but just the the uh, prosthetic and all that afterwards. Where yeah. like it's like it looks like something right out of Hellraiser, and you right. got like the bug crawling out and like into her hair. Um, mm -hmm. It was just like really well done, and, and like the the hands still like, again, yeah, the, yeah, and the legs too. Like her legs were the, quivering, and yeah. it was like, oh my god, she's still alive. Well, her, her face is half exploded, yeah. so she's feeling it, but she's also unable to shriek out or call for help or anything like that. Lord knows how they discovered her that way so yeah. quickly. And I felt bad for, again, Marge Gutman is another one I felt bad for. I liked her. She seemed like a good egg. I wanted to go visit her in San Francisco, her tiny yeah. little toy shop that she's trying to keep, you know, above water. And, and Ellie, like, like sure, so yeah, I'll come. I'll, 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 oh, I'll yeah, that'll yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these two, like, Dan and Ellie are just, like, so full of shit. They're, like, so deep undercover that they're, <laughs> they're just like, yeah, yeah. We're going to do that, for sure. <laughs> they took improv classes. They know how to yeah. keep the, the con going. But, but uh, the other thing, th with the Connell Cochran thing, though, yeah. in terms of, like, the Stonehenge of it all, like, he also brings up, and he pronounces it correctly, not Sam Hain, sorry, Donald Pleasance, but he calls it Sawin. And he talks about how there were sacrifices in the name of witchcraft. 3,000 years ago was the last one, because it was the last time that the planets aligned. So they're aligning again this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, on Halloween night, and he, in the name of, I guess, this is where the 
season of the witch comes from people often ex- uh, 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 accuse this movie of being misnamed it it's not that it's misnamed it's just we spend so little time discussing any aspect of witchcraft (laughs) because i think the only mention it gets is from dr dan chalice when he just kind of goes witchcraft in the middle of you know uh connell cochran doing his thing you know uh, breaking it all down for him saying like there was there was sacrifices or he didn't even say that just like there were blood there was blood that had to be spilled he'll be like sacrifices just like oh all in the name of appeals to the higher power witchcraft you know i mean (laughs) and that was it so, but that's the season of the witch for you. Yeah. So I guess it's basically well, him. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's the witch. Like, he's the warlock. Yeah. Uh, right. If, if we're we're using <laughs> the, the correct uh, gender for it, but right, the right. Uh, yeah, because that, that was always confusing to me uh, as a child too. Just like, where's the witch? I just assumed like the witch mask. <laughs> uh, witch yeah. Did. Yeah. Some but, people um, do that too. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I, I want to get back to the whole Bondian theme of it. Oh, yeah. It's not just it, it, like all the correlations, but it's also kind of like Austin Powers as well, because uh, <laughs> like you got the, the fembot. But like there's there's so many um, tropes that are in there, like leaving him to his demise and just like assuming everything will go as planned. You know, I could just right. see like, <laughs> it's just like, mm. no, we're just gonna, we're just gonna tie him up and like leave yeah. him be and just assume that it all, that he, <laughs> that he died, you know, like uh-huh. we're not gonna, we're not gonna make sure that he's dead. Um, yeah. The fact and also that, telling him your entire plan before. Yeah. You... <laughs> the, um, um, the Teddy is kind of like a money penny stand and she even says 100%. like, you'll have to take me out for dinner. Uh, mm-hmm. And he's and and or he said like I'll, I'll take you out for dinner. You always promise that. Like I you just right, see right. <laughs> Sean Connery. The eternal tease. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, there, like there's so many more. I I I I, I couldn't uh, remember them all well, right now. But the uh, the fembot of it all, like just the Austin Powers, <laughs> just like, <laughs> just just her suddenly be, being a robot. And this is mm-hmm. this is my biggest question. I know we've talked about it before. But yeah. is Ellie, like, was she always a robot? Or did they replace her with a robot, like, in the interim of, like, her being taken to the factory and, and him discovering her? Well, because there's also two, two ways about that. Like, yeah. I've, I've spoken to people who believe that they somehow shoved the mechanisms or maybe pulled her skin off and pulled them back over, like, a prototype they had. Um, which is why she's still kind of half formed, like she can't speak. And whereas we've seen the bots that are surrounding Some Conan Cochran, speak. they have yeah. speech. Yeah. yeah. So maybe she was just only, they were waiting for like, you know, her voice box to finish baking or something <laughs> so they could put it in. And that's why they had her tied to a, a table so she wouldn't wander away. Um, but, <laughs> and also she, it made for a good red herring for him, but, um, yeah. or at least a mislead, a mislead for, uh, but Dr. it was like, Chalice but they had, they had that. planned to kill him. You know, you know, he's right. already tied up in the room, so it's like it was, uh, you know, what I guess like a, a, a contingency plan in case he did right. escape. Uh, but Happy yeah, accident. The, the thing, but also, yes, go the, ahead. Okay, the argument that if she was always a, a bot would be yeah. that she kind of was sent there. She's not actually the guy's daughter, um, mm. but they just like created her to go down there and you know see if like did anyone else see anything like you know like yeah. you know just to, to make sure that uh nothing gets out and she probably knew okay well this guy was there when when it happened mm-hmm. so it was a thing of like let's form a relationship with him and and like mm-hmm. let's bring him out to the factory which i guess like it's in a way it's like you're sabotaging yourself because you're like getting him invested because like i don't think that chalice would have given a shit one way or the other he was just happy to like sit in the bar and drink so in a way, she kind of, if she was always a robot, she incited him to come along on this investigation. And mm-hmm. it like probably would have made more sense, like, well, just kill him and then, you know, leave him be where he is rather than take him with. So there is a strong argument to say that she was, you know, they, they did build a, a, a robot uh, after mm-hmm. they, they had taken her. Because then, of course, there's the the fact that they 
are having intercourse. And I mean, like Austin Powers didn't know that, uh, um, <laughs> who is the actress? <laughs> Which one? I, I haven't um, seen Austin Powers in so long. The, uh, who, who plays, played as, uh, Vanessa Kensington, uh, Oh, was that um 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 shit, the one who was dating Hugh Grant? Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, why can't I remember her? I can't either. God damn it! I haven't thought about her in many years. <laughs> Hugh Grant's got that new movie coming out. That uh, and she was in that heretic. remake of Bedazzled too, wasn't she? With Brendan she, Fraser. She was Elizabeth Hurley. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Hurley. I knew Hurley. so many yeah. more Elizabeths that I care about more than. <laughs> Her. No offense to her, but <clears throat> yeah, there's too many. <laughs> but okay, so yeah. Um, I also, I mean, again, like it seems like the, the the most obvious choice would be like, okay, she was really the daughter, and she went out and she got him. And then when they abducted her, they killed her, and they took a bot, and they just kind of like made it look like her. They probably started work as soon as they saw her and knew like, okay, we're gonna have to kill her and yeah. create a bot that will send around. No one will ever tell the difference because she's got no personality. Then, <laughs> <laughs> but she also had like some kind of like sense of the mission, you know, maybe a microchip somewhere or something. Mm. I don't know the technology exactly. I know it's not like the old lady because she was an old German like antique, yeah. the one with the gears that yeah. her head falls off. But I feel like there is, because I love watching this movie believing that Ellie is a bot the entire time, just because it explains so much about why she doesn't behave like a human being in any <laughs> instance. I, 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 think, I, I think from the moment she comes on screen to discover her father's corpse and identify him and everything like that, her reaction is just like eyes up and like a gasp, like, huh? Like, she just covers her mouth. <laughs> and there's no emotion tied in with it. There's no... <laughs> it just... I mean, I, I do genuinely get kind of like a sense just from the way her face is structured because she has these incredibly large brown eyes and just this mm. kind of mousy countenance. She reminds me of the Disney mice that helped out Cinderella and made her that pink dress to go to the ball before the stepsisters all tore it off. You know the ones I'm talking about? She just kind of mm. bears a resemblance to that. Anyway, um... <laughs> But Ellie, even like you brought up like, you know, the, the sex scene, I thought like she doesn't really move. <laughs> we never see any movement, yeah. anything that resembles any kind of like actual sex. She just kind of lays there and lets him do what he's going to do. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because maybe if he works too hard, like her head will just knock off like the old lady or like it does later when he knocks her head off. Yeah. Um, and and then uh, even just like that turning point that again, that that record scratch moment for me, the first time I watched the movie where just like, where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? Like, everything is about the, the seduction and about getting him to drop his guard. And it starts to even work because first sign of, like, a suspicious noise once they're in, on, you know, between the sheets, she's like, oh, what was that? And he's like, who cares? <laughs> and all I needed was just, like, a little grin or a raised eyebrow from her before she turned her face back to him. Like, just to I, show well, me, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe. That would have been an, an interesting touch just to put in there because, like, you're starting to think, like, you know, well, that was weird, but then you forget about it, and you're, you know, back into the mm -hmm. the adventure. Maybe that would have been like a more interesting thing for what's her face, uh, Teddy, to uncover, oh. where they're just like, just like, but he never had a daughter, <laughs> and then like, oh, that would have been great. <laughs> Oh my God! See, if it would yeah. have been a little bit more built in, but I, you know me, I'm king of headcanon. I'll watch it the way I want to watch it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think that there's there's no wrong way to to interpret no. that uh, of course that twist, as it sure. were. And I and I think that it is such a great moment at the end because like it like she is very creepy when they're just sitting in the car, and then you realize like she hasn't said anything this entire time. Yeah, since um, he saved her. Yeah. Yeah, and she's just sort of like looking like straight ahead, and then it's not until he's like. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> She's just like <laughs> triggered yeah. to like go Terminator on him. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that it's like there's you he uh incapacitates her. <sighs> oh, here here she comes again. Like just the uh <laughs> the, the sting of the, the jump scare. Yes. It happens uh twice after she dies the first time. Like there's the arm and then there's I think the the, the body with the head kind well, of for, no it, like it happens it. for I mean, like there's first is in the car. Yeah. of the sting and then and then it's like after he gets out and he just sees the arm there and then she comes up from behind and then he decapitates the the robot 
right, then he's right, like, right. Oh, okay, that's that's fine. And then and then she gets up and gets at him again. Yeah. So how many was that? Because I I was counting like it seemed like there was four. Oh, okay. I thought there altogether. were three, but uh, who knows? I could be I wrong. Know. Yeah, because it, it just kept <laughs> happening. But it but it didn't yeah. feel it didn't feel repetitious. It was just like, no, I could like let's do more because it was just funny at that point, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> it was it was full on slapstick. Like yeah. I knew I knew at that point, even in my first screening, like this is not going to scare me. This movie, I'm just I just need to lay lay back. But. Um, what I also another uh, thing that I always wondered about that I never because the movie doesn't seem to care that much about it. <laughs> but there's only a few scant kind of like pieces of evidence that I can use, and I'm just wondering if you ever had a take on it. In addition to like maybe this conspiracy theory about Ellie being a bot the entire time, what is your take on the town of Santa Mira when they move into it? Because obviously everything is there to kind of like unsettle us and make it feel yeah. odd and Twilight Zoney, and like we can't drop our guard because. For all we know, all these people could be in on it. Do you think they are? Do you think they're people at all? Do you think they're just a small town and they see newcomers and they're reacting the way a small town would to newcomers? Like, what yeah. do you, what do you see when you enter Santa, Santa Mira? In uh, this movie? First of all, I remembered what the the other thing was because it was the hand oh. attacked him on its own, and then right. the and then the 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 body came up without the head. So that was that was for the town. Okay. I think that. I mean, it's kind of uh, implied by what was the guy's name? Was it uh, Starker or Sure Riker, like the homeless guy? Um, oh, okay, I forgot his name. Sure, he, um, I like him. Yeah, because um, he sort of he brings up this whole thing about how uh, he's been in that town his whole life, and when this factory came yes. in, like he went for a job, but uh, he wasn't hired because Connell Cochran brought in all of these people from uh I, I guess he outsourced from from ireland uh so yeah it's there's i guess there's two ways to look at it is that um the people in the town that like work for the factory and like you know the ones that we see in the windows watching them uh as mm -hmm. they as they drive in they are robots or they're other people who are like worship the the uh, oh, Samhain, and they're just sort of right. like you know, like his human people, like you know, like maybe like the receptionist at the factory, um, the, like just the ones who are clearly not the robots. I mean, they could all be robots, mm -hmm. but like if they're oh. not, I feel like they're there's there's obviously a thing because this town's got this curfew at six o'clock, which is like really fucking early. By the way, Jamie Lee Curtis's voice is the curfew, right? You yes. Know, everyone in there. You know. <laughs> so it seems like it's just like the the derelicts that are walking around after are all of the, I guess, the, the native uh, uh, population of the town like this guy. And there's there's very few of them left and they're just being taken mm. out uh, when they can be found. Right. Um, unless the that he was taken out robots. because he, he like announced out loud because it's sort of like Big Brother. They have... You know, their ears everywhere, and he said that he was going to burn down the factory, and they're like, well, let's take care of him right now, then. Right, right. He poses an, an Im yeah. more immediate threat, so he must be uh, dealt with more immediately. Yeah. Starker was his name. I looked it up, and I really liked uh, that actor. Uh, here, I want to sign, sign up my name, because uh, Jonathan Terry is the name of the actor who played him, and the reason I liked him is because I did realize, particularly at this screening, like I was like, I, I, a lot of people laugh at the part, part of the exchange where he says like, uh, hey, can I have a drink? I don't have any diseases or anything like that. It's like, well, I didn't think you had diseases until you told me you didn't, but, and then he gives it to him and everything yeah. like that. And how many people say I would never after a comment well, like this that. Well, I mean, this is, this is also 40 plus years ago and it's Tom right, Atkins, right. so. You're right. <laughs> He is uh, not discretionary at at, at all. Yeah. <laughs> he has no, yeah. There's 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 no safeguards yeah. built in. He has he has no walls, but uh, no boundaries. Mm -hmm. But um, except with his children, <laughs> which we'll get to. But uh, with this uh, one in particular, something about the way uh, the actor playing Starker like delivered the performance, I actually really appreciated this time around because I realized how easily. Uh, a homeless drunk in the 80s was given to a little bit more of a humorous cut so it wouldn't seem you know so tragic or i guess 
Um, so there, you know, even just like a little exaggeration of the slur with him just kind of, he could have just been you know, talking, I don't, I don't know diseases or anything. And he didn't. He, he actually just seemed like a man who was like down on his luck and who, you know, <laughs> leaned on the bottle a little bit. And I did, again, he was another one. This is why pockets of this movie work really, really well for me. I mean, I'll argue the logic all day and night and have fun doing it, but... Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like the people who expire, maybe not all of them, but a handful of them I do feel for. And he was one of them. When I saw him surrounded by all of these, um, you know, men, men in suits uh, who were there, who were bent, you know, like, like pushing him down to his knees and everything like that. It was so dehumanizing. And I just mm -hmm. and he looked afraid and they you pulled his hat off. And I don't know, just, I, it had me in it like step by step. I was there with him while he was experiencing what he was experiencing. And I yeah. thought, okay, that's good filmmaking, you know, and that's good yeah. acting on, on everybody's part. I feel like everybody delivered in that particular sequence. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say something about it rather than ha 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 diseases, you mm. know. Very good. Very good. I was going to say, there's also, there's uh, I mean, this came well before house of wax 2005, but there is a, like a house of wax, I forget what the town's yeah. name was and there where they like went to it where like everything seems like it's normal, but there's like something under the surface where it's just like, it ain't right. Um, <laughs> I'm just like, you know, like pulling the, the curtain back and being, or like looking at the window and like the old lady's actually a robot. And we kind of have that with like the, the toy that you mentioned already, which was the German lady uh, knitting yeah. the thing in the, in the rocking chair. So there, there is some sort of, you know, correlation there between the two movies. Yeah. yeah hey there you go that's a ticket yeah and i uh, like that <laughs> aspect of the house of wax remake like i thought that was really fun so oh me too yeah they did, 100%. It, they did it here first unless there's something else that, that did it before this that i missed <laughs> <laughs> what i did not miss because it also bears uh, uh acknowledging uh bringing it back to mrs betty kupfer and oh. her eclectic wardrobe <laughs> the fact that we we see her in three outfits they couldn't be more dissimilar from each other. And every single one of them, if I ever do drag again, I want to be Betty Kupfer at every stage. If I ever MC a drag show, I want to open in the little jumpsuit, her little purple, you know, drag kind suit, of jumpsuit yeah. that she that she meets uh, that meets our uh, protagonists in. And then uh, at like intermission or whatever, when I come in, I want to be wearing that incredible kind of like quasi victorian garb that she's got with a high neck but not a low hem it's like just below her knees but she's even got like the um oh what do you call it the, is it a cameo brooch. oh yeah like the brooch like but yeah. i think it's if you if it's set a particular way it's like a cameo over your throat and everything okay. like that and the puffy sleeves and you know <laughs> and everything <laughs> and it's made out of lace entirely like she looks like this incredible doily at your grandma's house you know with with she her hair like all something that belongs around judge judy's neck yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> but it's also modernized because you can see her calves and her ankles yeah. and whatnot and then i'd probably close out in um her death uh war her death outfit which makes her really, I just kind of felt like she resembled a, an American tourist in Costa Rica or at least Florida, you know, like something like that. It looked very tropical, very kind of like off the shoulder. And, and she looked her most comfortable, like in the entire movie, which is odd because she's wearing a jumpsuit when we met her. But and when you she... do this, this uh, MC job, you have to have like a bowl <laughs> of fake fruit for that last. Yes, time. right. So I can pick up the, the green grapes, the fake green grapes and go, ha! <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just in the in my final scene, we'll just have one of the Go Go Boys run on with a pumpkin mask over his head, and he'll just tear at it and fall to the ground. And rattlesnakes and crickets will. Okay, that was another thing. We never really had it explained, and sometimes things are when they're unexplained or more mysterious, and therefore more scary. Yeah. I, I I find I only have questions because I remember even watching it as a kid. The first time yeah. I saw it, I was like. Is this supposed to scare me? I think it's gross, and I do like gross, but mm -hmm. rattlesnake gross is different than, like, you know, Freddy Krueger gross. And um, there's something about, like, watching rattlesnakes escape, <laughs> and other kinds of snakes as well, yeah. uh, but the ones that are lethal are the rattlesnakes and crickets, of all yeah. things, like, escape this little boy's neck <laughs> after he falls to the ground mm -hmm. and the snake's attacking his father and everything like that. Like, it's... 
I don't know. And, and as an adult now, all I can think is like, oh, what did they do to the poor snakes to make them coil up and get really defensive like that? Like, I feel, I always feel bad when I see snakes on the defensive in old movies because I'm like, you know, <laughs> like, what did you do? How yeah. much did you agitate it? And how much time did it take for it to, like, calm down? Did anybody get hurt? Like, I mean, did we even have those things back in the day that said, like, you know, no animals were harmed in the making of this film or anything like that? I know you couldn't do it in OG Friday the 13th. I didn't. Um, I didn't check, but this is just two yeah, years I, I removed didn't. from from Friday the Thirteenth, and like yeah, yeah they clearly like snake killed was that snake and, and chopped Friday. into many pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know. Probably not. I don't think that it uh, was a thing yet. Yeah, but, but is there any correlation between like rattlesnakes and crickets and Sawin? Like, I mean, is it supposed to be autumnal? Is it supposed to be <laughs> what? Are, what? I mean, why crickets? <laughs> I don't know, but it's just, it's just uh, like, yeah, it's just supposed to be Creepy crawly, just give, makes you uncomfortable, like, ugh. Yeah. Like, okay. No, because also like, it looks like a spider comes out of Marge Gutman's mouth, like yeah, a giant like that's a, spider. Yeah, like, that's a, a spider there. Um, mm -hmm. No, I think that it's just, like, it's magic, you know? Like, it's, whatever's <laughs> happening, it's, like, this kid's head is, like, imploding or rotting from the inside from, like, this shock or whatever... It is, yeah. and there's just like it's like now there's just Ugh. snakes. It's like a portal, uh, for, for all this shit to to be coming out. It's a great fucking scene. Like it's a great kill, and mm -hmm. yeah, like memorable. They, memorable. Yeah, the the fact that they're they did do away with this awful child, uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Junior. <laughs> Buddy Junior. Yeah. The first thing I he love does the, is ride uh, away and flip off his mom. He's a yeah. piece of shit. Yeah. Oh, he's, yeah, he's a little <laughs> asshole. The, um, the actor who plays him, because there was, like, he interviewed, and it was, like, back in 2014 for the, the, uh, b the release of the box that I've got. Mm. And, uh, he's talking about it. He's just, like, these movies were awful and, and, and like they're, they go against oh, everything right. for like, like he's a religious type uh, yeah. at, at this point. So it's like they offer, they're like, yeah, we want people to come back and like just recollect on the thing. And he used it as an opportunity to just like talk about how sinful uh, horror movies mm. were. And he just like, and they killed uh, like a child in this movie. It's just like, horrific Jesus. like just like yeah he on um, screen <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that. i mean and that's odd because children in peril that will immediately get me into a movie if it's done well like i'm not yeah. just gonna be like yeah it's killed a child but i mean if you it's the ultimate vulnerability like i see a frightened child and something coming after it you're hooking me in because i'm terrified i i'm you know either the child has it coming <laughs> and we all want to witness in the name of morality or I feel bad for the kid and I want to see them get out of this because it's a nightmare scenario. But yeah, uh, I think I remember, I don't know if he was the one, but I think, wasn't he the one who made the comment of like, you read the newspapers and you see something violent happen and then you know it happened because of you, because you made one of these movies, one of these horror movies. And I'm like, what? I don't think it quite works that way, sir, but it, I mean, it might have been believe him. what you want, I guess. I'm scrolling. Yeah. I have, like, the documentaries on my computer here, so I'm just scrolling to see if I can find it. Uh, um, okay. So I'll, 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 I'll let you know uh, if it comes right. up. But, yeah. Um, the practical effects in this movie are, are fantastic, and I think that, like, mm -hmm. it's it's one of those things that's just, like, it's it's overlooked because of the whole, like, absence of Michael Myers that, you know, people don't appreciate it for, you know, what it is doing right, uh, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, you said that you wanted to talk about the, the other kids, I guess, like, the Chalice kids. Oh, his children, yeah. yeah. Well, because this is the thing. I, I don't think I ever... I either saw it and I forgot, or I never clocked it before, when Ellie first comes into uh, Dr. Dan's bar yeah. <laughs> days later, or, you know, the next day, whatever. Yeah. And there's something that we didn't see on screen, so maybe that's why I didn't register or why I just don't remember it, but she thanked him for attending the funeral of her father. So there was enough time for her to come and to, for them to exhume the body, for them to get everything put together, for them to have a funeral, and then for her to go and search for him like in this bar. And we're led to believe that in all of this time, it feels like days have gone by, but I, I don't know if the dates confirm that in the captions. But however much time has gone by, 
He has taken no opportunity to visit his own children. <laughs> Yet he has visited the funeral of a man. And maybe we're supposed to believe that it's through intrigue from the death, like in a question, because the man going on about them killing us all, and maybe he had, was supposed to be endowed with a genuine concern for humanity. But the problem is they never plant that seed. So it really does feel like he, this man abandons his children to go spend a weekend <laughs> hunting along for someone he's never yeah. he, he never knew before a couple days ago with the daughter who he's only known a day. And he's got that six-pack ready, raring to go. And I, the worst thing the kids did was have a genuine response of disappointment when he gave them gifts that they had already been given, but in a better form <laughs> because they wanted the silver shamrock masks. He wasn't around to know that they wanted that. Yeah. So they look at these like dime store, you know, plastic masks that he picked up and they're supposed to go, Oh, thanks dad. I don't know. I feel bad for well, the those kids were, as well. Yeah. Like the masks <laughs> that they got, like, uh, I think one was like a, one looked like the, the, your next, like it was like a Fox, like a, yeah. White fox something, or something like that. The other yeah. one was like a ladybug. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so lame. But uh, yeah, they were they were they were bullshit. They were like things that you got at like the the uh, drugstore for like probably a buck each. Yeah, um, he paid more for the beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the well the the one the son is actually I guess he's had uh, a bit of a career. He wrote yeah he's the, great. Uh, Joshua John Miller, who plays Willie, Willie, Willie mm -hmm. Chalice, Willie and Bella, Willie Chalice. So Joshua John Miller uh, wrote The Final Girls. Did you see that movie? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did. I did as well. It's not really for me. Uh, yeah, but, that's all uh, I'll say. Yeah. he. Uh, but more recently, he um, wrote and directed The the exorcist it's 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 called the exorcist <laughs> on imdb but it's actually the title on the poster is the exorcism it was that thing that came oh. out with russell crowe this year that was actually shot like five years ago before covid oh. and it just got shelved it was like produced by kevin williamson right so, right, right yeah it's it's sitting okay, at a 4.1. Okay, I heard some things about that too. That's that's a load of fun. <laughs> it's sitting yeah, it's sitting at a 4.1 out of 10 on IMDb. And it, like I think it was like okay. in, if it did get released theatrically, it was like around for maybe a week. But uh, uh, yeah, as long, as long as he's keeping his hand in the genre, because he was also, I believe, the second I saw his face, I was like, I know that face. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen the 1980s movie Teen Witch. He's the little brother of the titular Teen Witch. He and he he's amazing. He gives this incredible performance where like she puts a spell on him where because he's kind of a shit and he talks like nasty about her. So she kind of puts like uh, I don't even remember if it's a politeness spell or what, but she just makes him more agreeable. So like <laughs> he like wakes her up with breakfast in bed one morning and he says, and I took the liberty of ironing your homework. And it was just, <laughs> it's just an enchanting. Per pitch perfect actor. He also played, uh, Anthony Perkins had a pilot that never got picked up uh, about like a horror family, kind of Adam's family esque, but a little bit more contemporary in the 80s. And he played the son. And there was this incredible moment in just the pilot where the son is uh, kind of sad because he feels different. And Anthony Perkins has a moment as his father to tell him, like, being, being different isn't so bad. And the performance that he gave, like his eyes were welling up and he seemed genuinely, you know, distraught and heartbroken and genuinely comforted by Tony Perkins. So he's, he's made good. I think he, yeah. his legacy will, well, will I mean, live, these kids live had on. like nothing to do here. Like they were there here. They have nothing the, to do. The mass and like sit right up in front of the TV. Um, and I love that. Like the, uh, Linda Chalice. That's funny that her yeah. name is Linda in this, because uh, I guess they couldn't do Annie again. But yeah, uh, she's. she's <laughs> I, I for some reason I thought that she said like don't sit so close to the TV, but that was like the uh, the mom later on to the the kid. But here she's right. just like turn that down because it's like you know with that fucking music comes on, you're just like yeah enough of it. Like she's just she just exists to just be this like. You know, like <laughs> nagging, what ex-wife, 
And I love that she like she says to him like, oh, booze and doctoring. That's a great combination. <laughs> like in, in the most. <laughs> <laughs> the most Annie you'd almost, kind of way. <laughs> yeah, you'd almost expect when he calls her for one time for her to answer, hello, oh, hi, Paul, you know. Oh, hi, hi Dan. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but I also just love that moment. It felt so authentic because it shows that he's got actually got some pretty good kids because she tells them to turn it down. And um, uh, her, his little son like turns around and like looks at her. And it's a moment of like, uh oh, what's he gonna do? And he just turns to the TV and he turns it down and then he sits back down peacefully. And I'm like, okay, good kid. Yeah, do what you're told. Yeah, she. <laughs> I, I wish that she had a bigger career, mm-hmm. or even mm-hmm. a bigger part in this movie. Like she, she is memorable, yeah. like <laughs> for sure. Well, that's the thing. If, movie, like, but if, I wish she could have done more. If like John Carpenter and, and Deborah Hill kept doing these movies. Like mm-hmm. Halloween Four, she would have just shown up as a new character because it was like, yeah, they, they who else appears in this um, from? Oh, Halloween? um, Michael Myers. Um, I, oh, you me Dick Warlock. Dick Warlock. Dick thank you. Warlock, the just the best name ever. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. He's, he's, Perfect for this movie. <laughs> he's one of the the robots. He played uh, the shape in Halloween Two. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the I one with the oval face. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like it. You know, the fog, there was, because uh, uh, Nancy Loomis is also in that, but Charles Cypers mm-hmm. uh, and Jamie Lee Curtis. And, uh, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is in this as a voice as well. Yes. But, uh, yeah, it's just, like, all the same people just coming back and, and mm-hmm. working together. And Tom Atkins was, you know, obviously in The Fog as well. It Like, had The had the Fog been the first, like, Halloween 2? Like, say, Ooh. Halloween 2 never existed and it was... I mean, even though I like Halloween 2 better than The Fog, but um, it's still, like, that That would have been fun. It's just, like, here's, like, Halloween 2, The Fog. Um, mm-hmm. Of just, like, it, yeah, it just takes place on Halloween night rather than, like, the, uh, whatever the, 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 the gimmick is in, in the movie. Just every John Carpenter flick afterwards that's a horror could just be Halloween. Just have it take place on Halloween. And Halloween, Halloween. Like, Antarctica. They, <laughs> Halloween, they live. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yeah. Just make the title a subtitle and put Halloween over the mm-hmm. over the, the the marquee, and yeah, you got money in the bank. Money in the bank. Mm-hmm. Um, I did also just wonder. Um, because another thing that I didn't notice in, in past times because I didn't. I, I never really speculate. He seems so uh, kind of, I don't know, omniscient, if that's the word, or, or just omnipresent, like Connell Cochran, like his grasp seems to be immeasurable because he's so confident that he's going to pull off this nationwide prank mm-hmm. and maybe some eventually take over the world. But um, <laughs> he doesn't speak that far into the future. But um, what's going to happen when, you know, the rest of the world sees that the U.S. doesn't get up for work the next day. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, <laughs> I wonder if he'll be kind to the Irish. But um, I just wonder about, like, the, the his reach and, like, how much of it is him. And, the, the, the again, like, the little tidbits I get in terms of uh, the fact that I think it's right before Ellie's abduction uh, when uh, Tom Atkins goes to, uh, or Dan Chalice goes to, the uh lobby of their motel and he tries to make a call and i think he's trying to reach teddy again Mm -hmm. and whoever it is he's trying to reach he can't and because he might even be trying to call i don't know silver shamrock i don't know who he's trying to call but it won't go through his call won't go through it's like they know it's him calling they know that he's who he's calling they also know to target teddy because well, it shows that like the the uh, the phones are tapped and they know where it's the right lines are going. Yeah. So and, and apparently they've been listening in and decoding. You know, like the fact that like okay, so there's somebody else in there who knows. And I don't. I, I, again, it's funny to me that they bide their time with Doctor Dan. I guess he's just not that much of a of a threat. <laughs> They're like, no, just send in the fembot. She'll. She'll, you know, seduce him and, and she'll, she'll jump out of the shower. She'll wrap herself in a blanket. He'll love it. <laughs> Make sure she has a teddy uh, in her tiny little, like, makeup bag that she uh, takes with her. And um, 
uh, because they go after, but they have no problem with kind of like going outside of Santa Mira and executing people publicly, yeah. <laughs> and then and then just kind of leaving. And if you were, if anybody saw you self destruct in a car, um, mm-hmm. it, it's it's not the lowest profile, but I uh, it just but it just makes me think. Okay, so the phones are tapped. Whether the people of the town, I don't know whether I want to believe they're all except for the, like the 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 people who are homeless. Um, if all the people who seem to have jobs and be doing well are all robots or if they're just people who totally, like you said, buy into the saw. Well, thing I mean, and, are you going more... to, yeah, you'd have to be, if you're okay with like the six o'clock curfew. I mean, not that there's anything right. to do in this town. They don't even have a movie theater <laughs> playing whatever happened to baby Jane 24 you know? like... seven. <laughs> they, they have yeah. access to Halloween, to John Carpenter's Halloween. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they can watch the that. big giveaway, the big giveaway. Exactly. So the big is, giveaway. Yeah. This is the thing, like just just Connell Cochran's reach, because clearly, like this is this is a, a brilliant man who's great at like organizing all this stuff and putting it together, but he just doesn't really have the follow through, because <laughs> it's so easy to first of all defeat him, like the, yeah. for for Chalice to escape, and you know even though you know whatever whatever your head cannon is for Ellie as a fembot at this point, she's still mm-hmm. assisting him in the destruction of all of this stuff. So she's not really doing a great job. It's like whose side is yeah. she on? Is she just she's just a fembot who's working for herself at this yeah. point. And he's just like, you know, they easily take him out. You know, Cochrane has that great like you know mm-hmm. moment. <laughs> Very James <laughs> yeah. Bond. Yeah. Um, and then he turns into like tinfoil and felt that spray painted silver. Yeah. yeah. And then just just disappears. Uh, just Jiffy it's Pops. It's like he yeah. like he he is a marshmallow that just sort of like melts and evaporates. But just then meow. the yeah. the um the, it's only on three stations or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, but it's just like <laughs> all it takes is for for Chalice to call in and just be like, you got to take it off. You got to take yeah. it off. So it's like he didn't even offer them any like i'll give you this much money to do this like this guy just calls into a station and they're like oh yeah he sounds perfectly sane let's like you know we've got this this guy who's you know paying a lot Mm -hmm. of money for this uh for this uh commercial time let's just take it off you know just because this one guy said that (laughs) dire things will happen if if you leave it up and like on on three stations altogether so it's like he he set all this stuff up to happen, but I mean, I guess he didn't really check in with the to, to make sure that the people would keep up their end of, of how things were gonna go down. So I don't know. He's a great yeah, villain well, in, in, in a sense that like he's menacing <laughs> and has a, a, a great villain presence, but just in yeah. terms of like his follow through and making sure that everything's going to plan, he ain't that he ain't that hot, you know. He ain't all that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, maybe the the maybe it was never maybe the the lack of an instinct for survival that was imparted to his bots originated with him. Maybe it was never about him, kind of like living large. Maybe he doesn't care about this mortal coil. Maybe he knows that something is waiting for him on the other side. I mean, if you're you know into the dark arts, you're probably gonna find a way to you know exist in people's dreams or to, well, you know that's fine but this was his life's work this was his his uh yeah. legacy and he, he but it was also a prank. <laughs> it's a prank but it was also supposed to keep going maybe that's why he was letting it happen maybe the applause was ironic because at that point no matter what you believe ellie is the previous scenes of the movie that she is definitely the bot by that point so yeah. he already knows that chalice is going to drive off with her and that she's going to attempt to kill him he doesn't know how easy she is to disengage i mean he has to try three or four times but <laughs> he gets there and he's not really that bright a guy yeah. but that's another thing is this, the, the the script kind of endows him with this knowledge because he kind of goes at the controls, right? Okay, first of all, like, the fact that they're hiding behind the masks, he and Bot, uh, Ellie, mm-hmm. it's almost like they're Scooby-Doo characters at one point when you see the, the, the little rack on wheels that they're hiding behind just drift from one side of the screen to the next. You expect to hear the Scooby-Doo sneaking, like, tippy, 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 like, <laughs> sound. Like Fred Flintstone and then, in the bowling alley. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And then, produced by Hanna-Barbera. And then, uh... 
he magically kind of knows how to launch the signal, even though he's not an engineer. He is an on-call physician. Yeah. <laughs> and, but he, know, he knows enough about this. So I'm like, okay, he knows how to like send the signal into directly into the monitors uh, of, of the room. We don't see any snakes or any crickets. I don't know why that... Well, because they're all robots. So organic matter attracts organic matter like the only reason yeah, the boy I would, yeah, attracted the I snakes imagine. and the crickets is because he's alive okay yeah. i never thought of it like and that. then and then uh, connell cochran like didn't get that chance because he just got like there's so much energy just kind of being absorbed yeah. into his body that he just <laughs> um Phew. just yeah pure yeah. energy pure energy i pure energy. think that i mean this is not a huge like plot hole for me because uh he brought chalice into the control room and he explained like he monologued his whole plan there <laughs> so it's like he he understood what was going on and i think that like through all of the events of the movie if, if there was anything that was kind of left unsaid that chalice kind of put the pieces together and and figured it out so it's not it's not a huge stretch for me um okay. it's more just like the di like what happens if like one of those coins as they were like falling like a laser just shot back up at, at them you know like it didn't right. seem like it was incredibly safe so well and that's another thing like it makes me wonder the planets are in alignment how long do the planet and this is just my nerd brain i just want to know like for how long do the planets align so that you can actually get that kind of a response because is is, is the whole point of the planets to align so that it can happen and cover that much land as much as like the United mm. States, the entire expanse of that, and that it's that powerful. Because if if the planets haven't aligned when Marge Gutman's fucking around with her own little tag, mm -hmm. and then she, it, you know, she it backfires and she's kind of like just a casualty. Like, well, then how did the power? Were the planets aligned enough for it to work? I don't know. I, I just don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, Dr. Dan knowing what number to call to reach all the networks at once is yeah. always hilarious to me. Like, just <laughs> kids are turning yeah. the channel. I'm like, there's one person. I love the... If it were a, maybe if it, if it were a satellite, like, company. Yeah. <laughs> like, In this day and age, it would be some... streaming. It would be like, take Netflix off of there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that the... Just uh, turn the satellite off. The, <laughs> Block the gas the station signal. attendant uh, comes back. It's the same guy. Um, yeah, he bookends who's the whole like, thing. kind of like, you know, because he shows up at the hospital, he's, he's got that, like, nervous energy. He's just like, I was always taught to, like, you know, do good and, like, you know, bring him <laughs> in. Can I go now? It's almost like, I don't want any trouble. But it, like, makes yeah. a point to kind of, like, linger on him and he's looking back as, as he's leaving the hospital because he does show up again at the end and he's like, hey, don't I know you? Um, yeah. <laughs> I like it. That, and that feels very kind of like Twilight Zoney to like yeah. have one person we don't know be the madman escaping something that he swears is after him and then we see it's true but like the gas station attendant just kind of sees him and then for Chalice to be the madman and him to even be like don't I know you you know yeah. <laughs> as Chalice is running in mm -hmm. do you believe at the end because uh, I know that uh, Tom Atkins has gone on record he's been asked like how do you, what do you think happens after the film ends? Do you think that they do turn it off and that, you know, you end up saving the kids? Or do you think that, you know, it seems kind of bleak at the end there? Do you, and he said, of course, of course they turn it off. If they don't turn it off, then what was the whole movie about? And I think that's kind of sweet. But I also feel like the portrayal of it makes it seem like it's intended to be a bleak ending. Like you didn't, you got so close mm -hmm. and you missed, you missed by just that much. Yeah. And now... And now the unleashing of the prank, you yeah. know? It's, uh, as, as you say, it's a, a, a bleak end, an oblique ending. Oblique? <laughs> a, oblique, <laughs> oblique ending. No, like, what is, that, I don't understand what he's talking about. Like, what's the point? Like, the point is that, like, not all movies have happy endings. Mm -hmm. um, it's about, it's, yeah. it's not about the, the, the destination. It's about the, the journey and the friends you made along the way. <laughs> yeah, I guess he hasn't seen many apocalyptic thrillers, yeah. if you can call this that. It's its own yeah. I, kind of apocalypse. I like to think yeah. that it's like the world ended, you know? Yeah, me too. Because <laughs> it, it's more fun that way. And, and that's why I, like... I can never see a sequel to this. Like, it's, uh, it's yeah. a one and done. <laughs> Some movies don't need sequels. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, um, I, and, and I, Carpenter, oh. Carpenter knows that better than anyone. 
Of course he does. Yeah. That said, and the, the not ending. the produce, not the producer side of him, but Carpenter, the, <laughs> the, the creator. Yes, there's a yeah. business man, the, the show business side of it. Like yeah. he understands. All right, I get why you want a sequel to that. Maybe, maybe we'll do it. Maybe I'll kind of direct it. But yeah. the other, <laughs> and then there's the other side. It's just kind of like purist. No, I never wanted yeah. it to be a sequel. There never should have been a sequel. Um, but I do, I do notice like another parallel with this and a Halloween movie that actually. I think picks up on this ending just because of the fact that he's screaming into the camera, just like the stop it. And then the screen goes black and we just hear the echoes of like his final words. Not exactly, but it's just kind of like, I feel like it's a slight wink to this movie in Halloween five at the end where Daniel Harris is just like, no, 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 no. (laughs) And all the blackness and everything like that, which uh, all both endings i mean it's not like i i feel ooh i'm chilled but they do both kind of depress me <laughs> i do leave both of these movies you know like i don't carry it but i mean yeah. it's just like a thing where for a moment like the chord it strikes in me i'm just like ooh that's that's depressing yeah, nice. yeah. <laughs> and then credits credits <laughs> the uh the only other thing i wanted to say really was uh i guess this is more of a headcanon thing but uh, we do see, and we might have talked about this in these episodes, but in the uh, in the kills uh, yeah. episode, because it's it, they the masks show up in 2018 in kills. I don't know if they're in yes in ends, but I know that there was a plan at the end of ends where you see the the Michael Myers mask on the uh, Laurie's coffee oh, no. table that it was going to show that it had a silver shamrock tag on the back. But okay. So my head cannon question for you is, um, and keep in mind, like in the universe of season of the witch, yeah. we see a preview for Halloween. 100%. So, so is is season of the witch a movie within um, the how ha- like Haddonfield universe where these kids are? Like they saw season of the witch and these masks are available and they got them, or are they both in the same universe and like these kids are like you know, gonna have the masks and like it's oh it, it, oh you didn't uh, you you survived Michael Myers don't worry you're gonna go home for the big giveaway at nine, um, <laughs> <laughs> or I mean what other scenarios could there be of well of, did of these, those yeah. masks in 2018 and kills have the silver shamrock tags on them oh, I can't remember well they must have yeah. That's part okay. of the, that's part of the design, because it's like it's almost like the whole thing with like um, how in Scream Halloween yeah. is on the the TV that they're watching, like I mentioned earlier. Yeah. But then in in H two O they're watching Scream two on yes. TV, where it's just <laughs> yeah. like there's this paradox of universes that are just not clicking because it's like, wait a minute. Um, and now we're now we have that in the in the Halloween franchise with like season of the witch where quite clearly Halloween is a movie that exists in this universe that that they're watching on the TV and then also yeah. we have in the proper Halloween universe the season of the witch masks exist. I have a kind I, 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 to to uh, follow on the coattails of uh, this bleak ending to this movie. I have a pretty bleak answer for you. I think. It's a poorly organized uh, Easter egg in a in a movie in, in, in a movie trilogy that's pretty lackluster, <laughs> and that's pretty poorly organized in and of itself. Yeah. Um, because because this is the thing, there's there's a way to do these kinds of things in a way that is endearing and that can even work for my little nerd brain, my little head cannon, and they're like, okay, so what? But uh, the the this this we've gone from a snake eating its own tail to a snake eating the tail of another snake, eating the tail of the snake from before. So two snakes eating their own tails to the point where they consume each other. And then you're wondering like, well, where is what they're swallowing going? They just <laughs> disappear. Mean, it just like, yeah, they just, just, just like Connell Cochran, yeah. they disappear in a, in a silver felty mess. Yeah. Um, because the, I, I actually remember thinking, I liked the fact that the movie existed as a movie in this. I thought, Oh, that's kind of yeah. cute. But if if you then take that take that into consideration and think like okay those silver shamrock masks are the silver shamrock masks of the movie prior they have to be 
like the same way you would buy a Michael Myers mask in this realm, like yours and mine of reality, where Michael Myers is a character, they would have to buy them as like the characters in that movie. Yet the movie that they're watching in the movie is the backstory of somebody who actually existed. So did they make a movie about her? Are we going, are we scream threeing this? Are, are we, or, or is it a yeah. new nightmare scenario? <laughs> 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 where Lori is really Jamie Lee Curtis <laughs> in 2018 Halloween. Like, I mean, it's just too many. It's not, it, it stops being fun <laughs> yeah. because well, it is so poorly organized. There's I mean, no, that's, yeah. But that's fan yeah. service for you. Like a lot of fan service that is. is just sort of like, we just got to get it out there and not really. Yeah, like, look at this thing we did. <laughs> I don't, that I thing mean, you like. my, my answer to it is that I don't really care all that much. Yeah. Like, I think I thought that it was fun <laughs> To yeah. see them in 2018, I felt because mm -hmm. it was there was just enough uh, yeah, just in kills. Through. It was like okay, now you're just you're overdoing it, um, and I'm glad that they didn't. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have cared one way or the other because I feel the same way about the David Gordon Green trilogy. That like if it was revealed that the the Michael mask was a silver shamrock, it would have been like oh, okay, like whatever. At that point, mm -hmm. like there's enough damage had been done, so it's just like it's just another thing. You're making me realize probably why I prefer like the progression from Halloween 1978 to Halloween 2. I prefer that to the progression yeah. from Halloween 2018 to Halloween Kills. Because I remember a lot of people were impressed by kills that he brought back. And I think initially I was too, mm -hmm. that David Gordon Green and um, uh, Danny McBride brought back like so many characters they had kind of like introduced in the first pick in the, in the first movie. And then it you know, progress and we got to meet, get to know them more, got to see them killed in a hideous way or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, it just made Haddonfield so much, feel, Haddonfield feel so much smaller uh, a town than I ever thought it was because, yeah, there were some characters who we got to see, like Annie have her eyes closed in Halloween too. And we got to um, see the Strode still kind of MIA <laughs> for no discernible yeah. reason. But we also got new characters, you know? We got new people introduced who are now icons in their own right, in their own movie, that don't have to be connected to somebody else. The only people they need to be connected by is, like, if you say Laurie Strode and somebody knows, like, oh, I know Laurie Strode. Like, you know, I, I'm not her best friend, <laughs> but I know her. We've known each other before. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, there's something about, like, that world that seems a little easier and a little less fan service-y. A little like, look at all the work we did. You know, it's just kind of like, no, sometimes if you spend enough time in a town, you're going to meet a bunch of people, even in one night. So, I don't know. That's how I feel. is <laughs> <laughs> Sad Betty Davis. Yeah. And um, who would she play in this movie? <laughs> who, who would Betty play in... Uh... In Season of the Witch? Oh, Connell Cochran, of course. Yeah. she Because Betty Davis actually did a, uh, a TV movie. I guess it was a pilot that just didn't get picked up. It was called Madam Sin, where she, yes. she, oh. she, like, she played in, in Asian Face, the, uh -huh. the, the Bondian villain of, of the movie. So it would literally just be uh, Betty Davis as like an Irish witch in You're right. witch. <laughs> it's a prank on the children um but <laughs> love it all right uh let's get to the cherry pick it's not like we killed them on purpose all right we need a cherry on top for it I mean, Colin. we just recast him, but I think it should be Connell Cochran. He's the one I have the most fun watching. How about you? Um. Yeah. What? Uh, what is it? Dan O'Harley. Dan. What's yeah. Herlihy. 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 Oh, but also just shout out to we didn't mention her because she doesn't really do much in this movie. But uh, Mady Norman. We were just talking about Betty Davis. Mady right. Norman was in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, and she plays Nurse. What's her name in this? She's not on uh, Nurse Agnes in the beginning. Yeah. He's the one. She's the one who Chalice slaps her slaps ass her and ass. Yeah. she giggles about it. And... Yeah, yeah. She's... <laughs> and then she, she just she helps him discover. I think no, she's the one who sees 
the bot after he kills she, uh, she Mr. Can't, she can't Bridge. put the, the words together, but she's just pointing <laughs> down the hole. <laughs> she, yeah, and I'm like, you are made of stronger stuff than this, matey Norman. Yeah. You stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Betty Davis and made her feel intimidated. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> oh, And it's not her fault. She was doing what it was scripted, yeah. but they should have been like, we got matey Norman, let's well, make her tougher. Wasn't but Dan, Dan O'Herlihy, uh, he was in yeah. the, the Robocop movies right oh right I, I haven't seen them in so long yeah but i think you're right yeah yeah uh anyway okay. anyway yeah I'm, so I'm i'm good with that i mean like i love tom atkins but yeah don chalice uh, dan chalice is is a bit of a you know a deadbeat <laughs> <laughs> yes oh and he is credited yes as the old man in robocop and robocop 2 uh dan o'hurley he is and he was nice. in the last starfighter how nice there you go all right yeah. uh last week or a couple weeks ago, uh, <laughs> we asked you who deserves to die the most in idle hands. I yeah. nominated Officer Ruck. You nominated Randy. Yeah. Across Patreon, Instagram, and YouTube, the final vote was 256 for Ruck versus 157 for Randy. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Thanks for showing up, people. Uh, <laughs> Dreyfen 19. Out of these two, I'd go with the cop. However, in my opinion, neither of them deserve to die. So it'll be interesting to see why you chose these two. No. Oh. Chris Massey can't be Randy because he keeps his hands idle by working on his trek. He keeps them from being idle by working on his trek. <laughs> I'm just reading what is what is. I know. I'm right. not correcting you. <laughs> Well, you don't have to correct anyone. I know that, that go that's know. very difficult for you, but Oh uh, you're yeah, yeah, you know what? To to speak from correcting people. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Baker, I'm I'm go with Randy because why not? Okay. Amethyst Thanks. Frost. Randy, I guess, but everyone in this movie can die. Since I only saw Idle Hands <laughs> for the first time last year as I was making my way through all the movies on Zach's 90s teen horror ranking video. I liked the oh, podcast nice. and how it discussed the nostalgia around Idle Hands much more than the movie itself. For the record, we did have two characters as Cherry on top previously with good old Clannibal. Uh, so I guess Cl Silence of the Lands, we, we chose both Clarice and Hannibal. We did? I guess so, yeah. Oh my god, I forgot I completely forgot about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. how do you choose? How do well, you choose? Yeah. And yeah. Amethyst Frost is, is uh the bookkeeper. He's got all yeah. the stats of just I no, I trust Amethyst. Go 100%. yeah, if you go to the YouTube page you'll see in like the tabs there's this his spreadsheet there. Uh, if you want to go over all the history of the, the cherry picker and whatnot. Yeah. Chase the Beast. I'm going with Officer Ruck. He and uh, McMacy both, but mostly Ruck. Hashtag Anton did no wrong. Uh, Mike Baum. Go, go, Buffalo. Baby Ghoul. <laughs> it's tough to vote for someone when I'm not fussed either way. Both of these characters are okay, I guess. So I think it makes the most sense to choose Randy no one should be that obsessed with an inanimate object. <laughs> and then what, Thank you. <laughs> what the Gale asks, what did Randy do wrong? LOL. Oh, okay. Bananas are good, but Randy didn't die in the end. Okay, come on. You, oh, we have to go over you this know, again. <laughs> yeah, you know how this works. You don't have to die to get nominated. You have to, to deserve to, to die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, Chris Darkcolor. Randy, one, dude tries to pick up a high school girl, uses homophobic slurs and compares hair metal to Mozart and Beethoven in a span of three minutes. Two, willing to let his friend get stabbed over his truck. Yeah. Grant Dempsey, Randy, for how happy he looks right before he gives an unconscious Debbie mouth to mouth. And again, for yeah. some reason, when Debbie tells him and Anton that the hand is gonna take Molly to hell. Mm -hmm. Marv, Marvin uh, A. Hugh? Uh, <clears throat> Randy is stupid, but Ruck is just an asshole who's salty about not being befriended by the younger kids at school and now okay. uses his position of authority to bully Anton and he and his partner write him up for an empty baggie. You just know they would have gotten worse if they lived so they can suck it. 
<laughs> okay. Silent Saturn says, I voted for the hot guy over the crooked cop last time, so this time I vote for the cop. I don't think Randy <laughs> stands out all that much in a film uh, where woman and women in general are being treated as objects, and Jack Noseworthy was a big part of my gay awakening when he was in that always that's that always video from Bon Jovi back in the day. Oh, oh sweet, wow. sweet memories. Nice. I understand and I respect that. Okay. Okay. I got a vocal minority though. That was nice. He, so who are you gonna did. pick? I'm gonna pick. Uh, Buddy Cupfer Jr. because <laughs> like the scene needs to be in the movie. Like that kid has to die. And just for being a little sh like the that mom was just so sweet and like doting to him and, and what does he do? He just rides off on his bike and flips her the bird. You know what would have been mm -hmm. funny if like he rode off on the bike and a truck came and hit him? <laughs> it's pretty grim. <laughs> He wanted him, you wanted him yeah. to die earlier. Yeah, he's just. <laughs> but that yeah. would have made that would have made Betty really sad, though. Poor Betty Cupfer. Well, she, she, a hard she got life. sad anyway. But yeah, he uh, <laughs> he was just you know obnoxious child. Got yep. what was coming to him. Uh, <laughs> what else is there to say? Okay, and I'm gonna pick uh, Doctor Dan Chalice uh, because <laughs> I just I I think I. I've experienced a similar thing when um, uh, we were going through the Bond franchise. Not all of the movies. Listen to those uh, C pads if you haven't already. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, being exposed to all of these Bond movies and trying to decipher what attracts people to a leading man like that when he's not motivated by any kind of like real inner uh, uh, sense of like the right thing of you know like uh, of of liberty or of justice or of um i don't know even just like protectiveness over people he should be protecting like his children like he thinks about them in the 11th hour like he does give a call <laughs> to his wife but by then it is so late it is so late in the game for him to give a shit about the fate of his children he doesn't mention them once to uh ellie so I don't really believe they're on his mind all that much. And um, I, I just think he's selfish. I think he's he fails upwards when he does succeed in this movie. And I just feel like the time and the framework of the movie, like the time it was made and, and the way that they present him, like he's, like we've discussed many Final Girls by default, he is a leading man by default. He, I think he's just a schlub. And I think that actually because it's such a bleak ending and because he has no effect on the outcome, I believe he should just die. He should just die. He didn't make waves in any direction. <laughs> he made things a little bit more difficult for Connell Cochran, but at the end of the day, he had no impact. So fuck him, kill him, get him out of the way. Where's Kurt Russell? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, there you have it. Uh, you can either vote for Buddy Cup for Jr. or you can vote for... Dr. Dan Chalice, who's yeah. apparently been kicked out of the palace. And the, <laughs> what was the, you were doing this like rhyme for me earlier. It was the, it's a bit from the court jester where the pellet with the poisons in the chalice from the palace, a vessel with a pestle or a flagon with a dragon. Uh, okay. And that's, yeah. There we go. Yeah. It went, it went on and I won't do that. Do we, thank no. you. <laughs> uh, for, the, for the sake of context. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, vote on... Patreon, uh, even if you are not subscribed, you can head over there and get a free vote. But if you do head over there, you know, consider uh, jumping on board and, and supporting me and my channel and this podcast. It uh, really goes a, a long way in, again, keeping the engine running. And there is also the possibility of uh, signing up at the Freddy Krueger tier and getting access to all those cherry picker after darks or the C pads, as we like to call them, uh, including the James Bond rankings that that edward just mentioned yeah uh, and final girl rankings so many so many different titles so many rankings and survivor yes. series yeah. survive scream <laughs> survivor uh, uh -huh. final final girl, girl survivor. survivor yeah oh my gosh yeah we did we did a lot uh yeah several several seasons now uh, you can also vote uh, by going over to our official Instagram account. So that is at the Cherry Picker Pod. 
Uh, so please follow us there. The polls mm -hmm. go up every week or uh, here on YouTube. If you are watching us, uh, it's in the community tab. Uh, if you're listening to us, head over to YouTube and subscribe. And also, if you would prefer to listen to us because you're sick of seeing our faces, the RSS feed link is in the description down below. And you can that way listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, mm -hmm. what have you. Yeah. Edward, where can they find you on Soch? You can Soch me on Instagram and on YouTube and on uh, Chick Shock and on Letterboxd at Edward is Truth. Uh, one word, traditional spelling. Uh, yeah, you type in Edward is Truth, one word, traditional spelling, you should find me. How about you, Zach? Uh, on Pornhub, OnlyFans, <laughs> <laughs> Grinder. We're not far from. <laughs> uh, you can find me on my regular YouTube channel, Zach Cherry. I'm also on Instagram at Retro Bitch Face. Twitter is Zach Cherry Eight. Letterboxed Zach Cherry. Okay. Yeah, that's all I'm. I'm comfortable with sharing for now yes. <laughs> um <laughs> what's going on next week i don't remember what is going on next week zach cherry <laughs> seed of chucky that one yeah. how could i forget seed of chucky uh so uh hope everyone has had a happy halloween or you're gonna have a happy halloween depending on when you listen to this and uh Thank you for watching, thank you for listening, and we will be right back.